Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Subin Motwani, and on behalf of Astra, I'd like to welcome you to the Facebook Live Ask Me Anything education session on radiation therapy for sarcoma. In honor of Sarcoma Awareness Month, we thought it would be a great opportunity for patients to ask questions to radiation oncologists about what it's like to have radiation and the, and the role of radiation therapy for sarcoma. And we have a great distinguished panel of radiation oncologists today to educate all of us. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Matthew Spraker, who is an assistant professor of radiation oncology at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. And he's gonna introduce our panel of wonderful speakers tonight. Dr. Spraker, take it away. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. So uh, tonight with us, we have um, Tom Delaney, who is the Andres Soriano Professor of Radiation Oncology at Mass General and Harvard Medical School. We also have uh, Stephanie Perkins, who is the Associate Professor of Radiation Oncology at Washington University in St. Louis. And then finally, we have Mayne Welliver, who is the Associate Professor of Radiation Oncology at the Ohio State University at James Cancer Center. Um, thank you again for this opportunity. I think this will be a great event. Uh, brief introduction for tonight. So we're going to review about 15 questions tonight, and they're going to cover a broad range of topics. Um, we had really amazing participation from the patients. Um, we had over 35 submissions, um, and we picked out about 15 questions that would cover a lot of the things that people were asking about. And then um, we aren't going to be able to answer everybody's specific questions, but definitely uh, we're hoping that we can incorporate some of that into future work and try to get everyone's questions answered over time. Um, most of the questions for tonight have been edited for clarity. And then just one note is that our goal tonight is to answer general questions about radiotherapy for sarcoma. Um, none of our answers tonight are intended to be medical advice for specific patients. Uh, sarcoma treatment is very complex, and we believe that every patient deserves personalized care. Therefore, we recommend that you consult with a multidisciplinary team, including a radiation oncologist, when making decisions about your care. So without further ado, let's dive in. So for the first question, I'm gonna field this to May. Um, what is the primary cause of sarcomas? What causes the genome to change leading to sarcomas? Hi, um, so this is a really good question. Um, and um, so, so sarcomas is, um, sarcoma is a, a group of cancers that arise from a, a type of cells or tissue called mesenchymal tissue. So as we know, cancer cells are, you know, malignant cells or abnormal cells. So. Um, the, the reason they're abnormal is because they have acquired mutations in their genome. And um, so, um, so they, um, um, so they, sorry, <laughs> someone broke into my, my office. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, so th these um, abnormal DNA um, that occurred in mesenchymal zinc cells eventually could develop into uh, cancerous cells, and they are referred to soft tissue sarcoma. So um, sarcomas are rare, and it's about 1% of all adult, adult cancers, and it's about 12,000 cases per year in the United States, and, but they can cause about 5,000 deaths per year. So let's see. Yeah, I think a lot of people um, in general, we, you know, I think for most cases, like we don't, we don't really know, as you said, they're just mutations that happen to these mesenchymal cells. One thing that we often tell our patients is that um, some sarcomas very rarely can come from prior courses of radiation therapy. So we do see that sometimes. That actually leads me to the next question, which I think was an excellent question. Um, and I'll direct this one to you, Stephanie. Um, so for patients where um, where we feel that the sarcoma came from a prior course of radiation, we call those radiation-induced sarcomas. One of the patients asked, 
for anyone getting radiation for any kind of disease, what is the average risk of causing a radiation-induced sarcoma with radiotherapy? And have the risks decreased over the years due to new technology or techniques? Yeah, so this is a really good question. It's an important uh, consideration that we think about anytime we recommend radiation to our patients. And, you know, it's hard to give a single number to, to ask that. Um, there's several factors involved. Um, one of those is a pediatric radiation oncologist is the age of the patient. So it does appear that children uh, can uh, be at an increased risk for a secondary sarcoma. Um, and that's somewhat due to the length of time that it takes. And obviously our children that are survivors go on to live many healthy years. It depends on the field of radiation. So larger fields of radiation versus smaller. And it can also depend on the dose of radiation. So it does appear that higher doses of radiation sometimes are more often associated with sarcomas. In general, I tell patients, um, you know, my adult patients, I would say the risk of a radiation-induced sarcoma is probably on the order of maybe two to three um, percent for uh, for children. I don't usually discuss just radiation-induced sarcomas. We kind of talk about all all cancers. But for, for patients that undergo radiation, that risk can be around the 5% range for, for pediatric survivors um, that have undergone uh, radiation. It's also important that the data have shown that chemotherapy can actually contribute to the risk of a secondary malignancy or sarcoma. So that uh, contributes to the risk as well for patients. Yeah, and I think um, I think that's an excellent point. And just to kind of emphasize, I think that we all see a lot of sarcomas as specialists, and certainly the people who have radiation-induced or radiation-associated sarcomas are, are relatively rare. Most of our patients have sarcomas that are um, spontaneous or we don't know what caused them. Um, okay, moving on to the next question. This was a really good one as well. I'm going to direct this one back to you, Meg. So this one is heading into asking questions about treatment specifically. So for treatment, how does radiation therapy kill cells and how is it used to treat sarcomas before and after surgery? Oh, I think you're muted. Thank you. There you go. Yeah. Um, so how does radiation kill cells? So the radiation introduces um, uh, DNA damage and as well as other uh, damage to cell organelles. So it kills cells by introducing DNA damage, including uh, single strand breaks, double strand breaks, and other, you know, particular different, you know, there are various mechanisms that could, um, that's behind cell killing mechanisms of radiation. Um, but what, so why doesn't it kill uh, normal tissue? So it does, you know, also affect normal tissue, but it prefers kill cancer cells because um, the radiation dependent cell killing depends on the cell replication. As we know, tumor cells replicate faster and it, you know, it grows without control, you know, so, so that's why it preferentially kills tumor cells. Um, and so it's, it's used with surgery to, re, you know, to really help to reduce the recurrence of, in the local area. So it can be used either before surgery or after surgery, but both either in either cases that it would, um, you know, basically kind of help to eradicate any microscopic disease outside or adjacent to the primary tumor mass that, you know, that we often um, see in sarcomas that, you know, the tentacles and, you know, the microscopic extension um, beyond what we could see um, um, of the tumor mass. So it can be used either before or after surgery. And Dr. Delaney will tell us more about when it should be used preferentially. Yeah, and I think so, so what you're saying is that when the surgeon kind of goes in to take the tumor out, they can only really resect what they can see with their eyes, right? And if right. microscopic cells are yeah. trying to leave the tumor or if they're in the tissue that they can't see, that, that's really where radiation plays a big role in minimizing Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Great. So yeah, that's yeah, exactly as you said, this leads us nicely into our next question. 
So um, the next question is getting a little bit more specific about treatment. I'm going to direct this at Tom. Um, so what factors do you consider when deciding whether to treat soft tissue sarcoma tumors with radiation or not, either before or after surgery, just in general when you're recommending radiation, what factors are, are the ones that you consider? Yeah, Matt, I think I'll follow up on what you had mentioned. Why do we use radiation in the first place? It's really related to the natural history, the behavior of these tumors. They tend to be uh, very infiltrative. They extend beyond what uh, the, the imaging shows and what the surgeon feels at the time of surgery. And the experience uh, over time showed that if you just remove the lump of tumor, you would have a high rate of recurrence of tumor. So the next uh, step in sarcoma treatment was to do very radical surgery, which would control the tumor, but unfortunately would often compromise function. The most, the most common site of sarcomas are in the, uh, in, in, in the legs. Um, and if you do radical surgery, you lose function. So it was found that a combination of conservative surgery, which would preserve the function uh, with uh, radiation doses that would eradicate the tumor at the same time preserve function resulted in high rates of tumor control. And there are a couple of studies in which half of the patients received uh, just surgery alone and half the patients had surgery and radiation. And radiation improved the tumor control from uh, about 70% uh, at the site of the tumor to around 90 to 95%. So that's why we use radiation. And as uh, as Dr. Welliver mentioned, we can use the radiation either before surgery or after surgery. And that decision is really based on uh, how the patient uh, presents, where the, where the tumor is. Um, it turns out you can use a smaller radiation field uh, because uh, if you deliver the radiation before surgery, because you don't have to track the surgical incisions or the surgical drain sites. And the radiation dose is also lower because the the, the tumor is intact and uh, the, the oxygen levels in the tumor are high, which improves the radiation sensitivity um, of the tumor. And so delivering the radiation before surgery in the long run results in uh, limbs that function better. There's less uh, swelling of the limb and the range of motion of the limbs and the, the soft tissues feel better. Um, however, radiation can um, increase the rate of wound healing uh, delay uh, at the time of the uh, surgical procedure. So patients who have a high risk of wound healing complications, and those might be patients uh, who have diabetes or uh, the, where the tumor is large and in the superficial tissues where it's, um, uh, the radiation will uh, most affect the, the wound healing. In those patients, they're um, uh, better off getting the, the radiation after surgery. From a cancer control point of view, the radiation before surgery uh, or, or after surgery has similar rates of cancer control. But the decision uh, as to which is, is best for an individual patient, uh, again, you, you'll hear this as a theme for almost all patients we see for, uh, for sarcomas, is, is to see physicians who are familiar with this disease and have those physicians see the patient before any surgery is done and discuss amongst the team what the best approach is for controlling the tumor and reducing the risk of late or early side effects. I can ask you to expand a little bit. Um, so can you also give a, a, maybe a little bit of an overview of what factors you might consider when you're deciding yes or no, should a patient get radiation therapy? Um, as you know, and we'll talk about this a little bit in more detail later, but some patients can probably get away with surgery alone. Are there certain factors about the tumor or the patient, whether you decide it's best before or after surgery, but if you're deciding overall to recommend radiation, what are some things about the sarcoma or the patient that you might recommend radiation versus not? And th those are uh, very good questions. Uh, for the, as, again, the, the most common site of sarcomas are in the lower extremities. And the majority of patients who are going to have a conservative surgical procedure are probably going to need uh, radiation because the tumors are often in close proximity to uh, critical nerves uh, or uh, blood vessels. But there are patients who have small sarcomas. Um, we, we consider small uh, sarcomas are those that are less than about two inches in size. And those that are in the superficial tissues uh, above the muscle, and particularly those tumors are what we refer to as low-grade tumors. When you look at sarcomas under the microscope, you can actually determine how biologically aggressive uh, they appear. And what are referred to as low-grade sarcomas are really tumors that are less aggressive, are uh, much less likely to spread. And th those are patients where if the tumor is small and superficial, we're actually quite comfortable with, uh, with surgery alone. As the tumor gets larger, as the tumor is higher in grade, and as the tumor is deeper, you increasingly uh, will, will need 
radiation uh, in conjunction with surgery to control the tumor. Okay, thank you. So what I'm gonna do now is move on to the next question. Um, share here. All right, so for the next question, I'm gonna direct this to, to you, Meng. Um, so for question number five, uh, what are the risks of the patient if they were to not have radiation therapy? So I think this question was directly asked by a couple of patients, and this does seem to come up in my clinic at least. I think it's uh, very reasonable for patients when you're recommending radiation to ask, well, what's the alternative? If I just go ahead with the surgery alone and I don't have radiation, what could happen? <laughs> That's a really good question. I think Dr. Delaney just now uh, answered some of that. I think um, uh, you mentioned that some low-grade tumors, um, superficial tumors, really small tumors, you may consider just watch and not do post-op radiation or pre-op radiation. And so, but when you think about it, the initial trials that compared um, radical surgery, which is it really, in other words, for amputation versus no radiation, in that in those trials, both low grade and high grade tumors are involved uh, or both or included. So, so, um, so the those earlier trials doesn't really help us to define uh, which patient could just let go of uh, radiation. Um, so, I think uh, you know this question um, was answered better by. Uh, a group of researchers at Memorial Sloan Kettering um, that um, they develop a tool to help us predict um, risk of recurrence um, um, by the factor of um, various um, factors like um, grade of the, of the tumor, size of the tumor, patient age, um, and, um, and histology. So, um, so you could, anyone actually can now go to Google and then try to find that um, by typing in uh, local recurrence risk um, and then sarcoma and then say nomogram, N-O-M-O-G-R-A-M. So if you, if you type those search words and this, this tool appear on, uh, in a Google search and that's the nomogram for local recurrence. Now, so is this absolutely accurate? Yes. Um, with the caveat that um, this is a very homogeneous group of patients and they were operated by excellent surgeons uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering. They're all very well-trained sarcoma surgeons. So would that be the same as say someone who just, you know, you know, tend to take the tumor out without any training that's, you know, very different. So I would say the latter will have, maybe you'll have higher recurrence risk and maybe you need to compensate by uh, another surgery or uh, post-operative radiation. Um, so, so if you type in your, the size of tumor, uh, the, the grade of the tumor, your age, and it'll give you a three-year recurrence risk and five-year recurrence risk. And so from some of the studies Dr. Delaney uh, mentioned, um, the local recurrence risk um, in five years after radiation is about, you know, between five to 10%. And then in those tools, um, you will see that without radiation, the re recurrence risk can be as high as 50% or as low as 15%. So then that's, you know, a, a you know, question for yourself, whether that 15% of local recurrence risk is too high for you to, um, to risk. Um, and then to have to deal with the recurrence later on or not, so. Yeah, and I think I, I really, I think I agree with what you're saying. And I, I think it really speaks to why it's important that patients do seek out a uh, multidisciplinary and a specialty team because they can actually talk very specifically about what would happen with the recurrence. Is there value to delivering radiation? Oftentimes the answer is yes, but not for everyone. So it's, it's definitely a complicated thing to make that recommendation. I agree with, with what you're saying. And there was a specific call to review some data, and we're lucky here that we that uh, Dr. Delaney was actually the uh, was was part of one of the one of the studies you mentioned that was one of the original studies that looked at the value of radiation in patients. So I've made a slide here to have him teach us a little bit, if you could, if you don't mind, Tom, about a little bit about this study that looked at patients who have surgery by itself or surgery with radiation. I'll put up my slide here. Yeah, uh, 
Thank you, Matt. Yeah, this was a study that was conducted at the U.S. National Cancer Institute in which patients were uh, assigned by the flip of a coin to either surgery or surgery with post-operative radiation. And it included uh, patients uh, who had uh, low-grade sarcomas as well as high-grade sarcomas. Um, so the high-grade sarcomas, again, are the ones that are more biologically aggressive and have a higher risk of spread. The patients with uh, low-grade uh, sarcomas received either radiation uh, or, um, or received surgery and radiation or just surgery alone. Uh, and the patients who had higher grades of sarcomas uh, received uh, surgery and chemotherapy um, or surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy. And when you looked at the results, the addition of radiation for patients with uh, high-grade sarcomas reduced the risk of uh, recurrence local recurrence from, from about uh, 20% uh, to uh, basically uh, less, than, less than 5%. And in patients with low-grade sarcomas, the, the uh, rate of local recurrence, the uh, regrowth of the tumor at the site where it originally arose uh, was uh, about 30% uh, with surgery alone. And when you added radiation, it was, uh, in fact, uh, again, uh, less, than, uh, less than 5%. So this uh, demonstrated that the addition of post-operative radiation to surgery improve the tumor control. Yeah, and that's exactly what these are showing here. So just to, for the for the audience, these are just graphs of how the patients had done. And this is a little bit uh, maybe counterintuitive, but basically these, this is the proportion of patients that have had controlled tumors or not. The controlled would be like 100% without a recurrence. And in both, in basically all the patients, and then if you look specifically at the patients with high-grade sarcoma, the ones that we tend to think radiation plays a very large role in their care. Um, you can see that a lot, uh, a good amount of patients with, that did not have radiation ended up having a recurrence over time, whereas a very small amount of patients uh, that had radiation did not. So that's really where, where a lot of the value comes um, from. Uh, that's one of the biggest studies that shows kind of why, why we, we recommend radiation as a standard of care for many, many patients. So, um, all right, so I think uh, we'll move on to one of my favorite questions to ask radiation oncologists about sarcoma. Um, and I think, uh, Tom, you spoke to this a little bit. Um, maybe we can have, um, uh, maybe, Ming, you can speak to this a little bit uh, as well. Is um, I'll put up the next question here. Is do you um, prefer to administer radiotherapy before or after surgery? Let me be, uh, so, yeah, let me be a little bit more specific for you, Meng. So for extremity sarcoma, do you, do you prefer to uh, administer radiotherapy before or after surgery? Um, so in general, I like to administer radiation before surgery just because the radiation dose is, is lower and the radiation field is smaller. So um, unless, unless the tumor is really, really close to the, you know, um, the groin area so that, you know, I think I worry about wound complication and that I try to avoid um, pre-op radiation. I, you know, I could consider post-op radiation. I don't know about others. Yeah, well, I think we, we Tom had talked about this a little bit as well, I think, and you mentioned really a big factor that at least I think about also, um, I also prefer pre-operative radiation, but the, in one study we had, we wouldn't have time to review tonight, we had found that people with thigh tumors or groin tumors can have a big risk of wound healing issues if they have radiotherapy before, so that's definitely a consideration. Um, I want to focus a little bit on retroperitoneal sarcoma for this question because it is really important for that disease site. Um, these are sarcoma tumors of the abdomen or retroperitoneum is sometimes the ter term we use for it. So Tom, in that setting, do you prefer to administer radiotherapy before or after surgery? Matt, for retroperitoneal sarcomas, uh, unlike for sarcomas of the extremities, we actually don't have what we refer to as level one evidence or randomized trial evidence that the addition of radiation to surgery improves uh, outcome. Uh, what we do know is that uh, with surgery alone, these patients have a very high rate of local tumor recurrence because the tumors often arise in close proximity to major blood vessels such as the, uh, the aorta or the abdominal wall, 
uh, structures that uh, cannot be uh, surgically removed or can only, or the tumor can be removed with just the, uh, the narrowest of margins or tumor at the edge of what's, uh, what's removed. These tumors are often uh, also quite large. The, what we call the median size, the, the average size of the tumors is about 15 centimeters or uh, six or seven inches uh, in, in size. For these tumors, if the uh, multidisciplinary decision is made that the, the, tum the patient uh, is uh, at high risk for local recurrence, and the patients at highest risk appear to be patients who have a liposarcoma, so fatty, fatty sarcomas in, in the abdomen. Uh, for, for those patients, particularly the patients who have uh, lower grade tumors, the patients with very high grade liposarcomas are probably at a higher risk of distant uh, spread than than local recurrence, but for the patients, particularly those who have large uh, fatty tumors in the abdomen uh, on the lower uh, uh, end of the, the, the uh, rate uh, scale for these tumors, uh, we, we do uh, consider uh, delivering radiation. And, uh, radiation is very much better delivered before surgery than after surgery. If you try to deliver the radiation after surgery, after the removal of these, uh, these tumors, uh, what happens is bowel falls into the tumor bed and it's impossible to radiate the tumor without radiating a lot of normal bowel. Uh, if you radiate patients before surgery, uh, the tumor is in place and it's displacing the bowel. Uh, and in fact, preoperative radiation is actually quite well tolerated for patients with abdominal sarcomas because most of what we're treating is tumor with a very uh, narrow rim of, uh, of normal tissue just uh, immediately adjacent to the tumor. So uh, in, the, in, in short for these abdominal tumors, uh, for patients getting radiated, they're, uh, they're better off being radiated before surgery. I think that's a, a really important point that definitely comes through in, in many guidelines and, and for most experts that treat, we, we generally do not uh, recommend post-operative radiation and retrograde sarcoma. I do wanna, um, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit just in the interest of time. So I wanna move now, we've talked a lot about what we can, uh, what considerations basically for making sure radiation is very well tolerated and safe for everybody, um, specifically in the pediatric population. So this question I think will probably best answered by you, Stephanie. Um, so are there any alternatives to radiation therapy that might be safer? So this question was specifically in response or in, um, in with respect to pediatric population or younger patients that we talked about may have a risk of radiation induced sarcomas or other toxicities. And then what about proton therapy? Yeah, so for pediatric cancers, it's really, um, it's really quite different from adults. So if there's parents here, you know, on the Facebook tonight, you're hearing about pre-op radiation, which is um, pretty uncommon for, uh, for pediatric sarcomas. You're hearing low grade and high grade, how we kind of, um, Put adults into one or two categories and that's not um, something that quite pertains to most pediatric patients so for kids we're dealing with osteosarcoma ewing sarcoma and rhabdomyosarcoma um, predominantly and then there are low-grade and high-grade sarcomas that are are rare but we also deal with for children and so of those three main sarcomas they really have been extensively studied in children for many decades and and have a pretty standard approach. Um, for osteosarcoma, we really don't use radiation very often for those children at all. It's predominantly managed with surgery and chemotherapy. In Ewing sarcoma and rhabdomyosarcoma, you know, the children's oncology group, which is the main group that studies pediatric cancers, I tell them, my residents, they really have two goals. One is to improve survival for our kids. And the second is for kids that are doing well, trying to reduce therapy as much as possible to decrease the side effects of treatment. So over the years, we've really studied as best we can which children really benefit from radiation. And we know that there are some children that do not need radiation, that the risk of recurrence is low enough that they can be treated safely with surgery and chemotherapy. So I think to answer that first question, there, I don't know that you'd call it an alternative, but we have learned that the children that don't need radiation, uh, their risk of recurrence is low enough that the risk benefit just doesn't make sense for those children. And um, in addition to that, maybe another alternative, I guess you could call it, is that we do try to reduce the dose of radiation for children where that's appropriate. So if they have had surgery, 
Um, we still think they need radiation. We may do a much lower dose than a child that doesn't have surgery. And then another thing for parents that might be on the call, we've talked about surgery, surgery, surgery. Very often in rhabdomyosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma, there is no surgery. The children just receive a biopsy and are treated with chemotherapy and radiation. And that's an appropriate um, you know, option for children, especially with sarcomas of the face um, or other areas that are difficult to resect. Um, remind me of the second question, Matt. Oh, for proton therapy. Yeah, so I'm going to show this figure that we have here about proton therapy. Yeah, so I think for children, um, there's several, there's a few special uh, considerations. One is that they're growing. Um, so when we're treating close to growth plates or treating large areas where radiation will affect growth, that's really important. Uh, two, they're still learning. So you can tell for a sarcoma of the eye region or the face, the brain becomes involved and that's an important consideration. And the third point is what I discussed the first time or my first question, which is that risk of radiation causing a second tumor 10 years down the road or longer. So um, a perfect radiation plan, we radiate the area at risk where the tumor is located and we don't give radiation anywhere else. That's the perfect radiation plan. Um, with x-rays, we do have exit of radiation that goes kind of through the patient. Um, the benefits of proton therapy is that we can control where the protons stop in the patient. So if we don't need it to exit out the patient, we can tell it to stop at so many centimeters in the patient. And so this can help with what I tell patients is kind of this low dose radiation, and that's represented by the um, picture on the right where you can see, I really only wanna treat in that blue circle by the eyeball, if you wanna circle that, Matt. But there's this spray of radiation that happens outside of that area because of the properties of x-rays. And then on the left, we have the same patient where we're giving proton therapy. And you can see that the eye, um, so in radiology, right is left, left is right. The right eye is not receiving any radiation, which is great. Um, or very low dose. I haven't turned it all the way down, but it's still extremely low dose. And we're also sparing the back part of the brain and the other temporal lobe of the brain. So, you know, this, this is what is important in the cases where we know a child will benefit from radiation, that without radiation, the risk of their tumor, tumor coming back is higher than we are willing to accept. Um, and I'll we want to do the best that we can to treat that area, but also decrease those long-term side effects as much as we can. And so at our institution, we utilize proton therapy for most, not all, but most of our uh, pediatric sarcomas. Yeah, and I'll just mention that we, we do use it in adults as well. Um, again, not for all patients, but, but some. Um, and I think that um, it, it definitely has its uses in extremity and retroperitoneal sarcoma in adults as well. So let's jump to the next question. So we actually mentioned this in passing a couple of times. Um, and I think this, is, this one's a little bit of a deviation from what we've been talking about, but it's a very good question. Let's see if I can show it here. So this one, I'll direct it, Tom. Um, so for chondrosarcomas specifically, what about radiation therapy after surgery for tumors that are low grade and that had negative margins? And I'll actually just take, I took a little liberty here and I just added, um, you probably could answer this question a little bit more generally for even also soft tissue sarcomas that are low grade. Um, what about radiation for those tumors? Not so uh, for uh, chondrosarcomas, uh, for those who don't think about these all the time, but these are tumors that have the appearance of cartilage uh, when you look at them under the microscope. And uh, bone sarcomas in general are, are uncommon. There are about 5,000 bone sarcomas per year in the United States compared to maybe 225,000 cases of breast cancer. So these are uncommon. Uh, like other sarcomas, they can arise uh, anywhere in the body. Uh, there are some uh, uh, sites of chond chondrosarcomas um, where we almost always use radiation and those are chondrosarcomas that uh, arise in the skull base where uh, the, the surgical resection of the chondrosarcoma really uh, is uh, can have a lot of side effects so the role of surgery is usually just a biopsy and then those patients are uh, 
uh, treated with uh, radiation, often by very specialized techniques, including protons that are uh, a nice technique in that area to, to, to spare uh, bone, I'm um, sorry, to spare, uh, spare brain uh, uh, from uh, additional radiation. Most chondrosarcomas, however, uh, arise uh, in the uh, extremities uh, uh, or elsewhere uh, in, in the trunk. And in general, for low-grade sarcomas uh, that are uh, low-grade chondrosarcomas that are removed with an adequate margin, uh, we in fact don't need uh, radiation for chondrosarcomas. The chondrosarcomas that we do consider radiation for are those that are incompletely removed, so either uh, um, incomplete uh, surgery or complete surgery with tumor at the edge of what was removed, what are called positive margin. And in particular for, for higher grade sarcomas, ones that also have a risk of spread where the local recurrence of the tumor is generally associated with a, uh, a decrease in, uh, in survival. Uh, and then just the last part of that question for low grade sarcomas, I think most of us, uh, particularly uh, um, for patients who have small superficial low grade sarcomas, uh, uh, tend uh, to radiate those uh, much less commonly. And uh, in the pediatric population, for example, patients who have low-grade sarcomas, even if there's uh, the tumor is completely removed, but there's low-grade uh, tumor at the edge of what's removed, we'll often initially just observe those patients because the patients uh, are very unlikely to have the tumor spread beyond the site of origin. And uh, the majority of patients are not going to have a recurrence. And you could reserve radiation for those patients who have a recurrence of tumor. So I think um, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump ahead again. I think a couple of questions we got are very topical, so I'd like to um, get to those for sure. I think a lot of people are, are curious about this. So for the first part of this question, I'm actually going to direct it back to you, um, Stephanie. So this question is, is, is quite topical, and the question was, with school starting back up, what are your thoughts on kids going back to in-person learning? Oops in-person learning who recently completed treatment for Ewing sarcoma and received whole lung radiation? Um, and then is it okay for them to wear a mask all day long? Um, and I'll actually just, um, I'll, I'll actually generalize that for basically kids getting any radiation. Um, and, and you can answer also a little bit more generally. Yeah, you know, this is a really good question. I'd love to hear Tom and Ming's thoughts on this as well. Um, I'm definitely comfortable with the children wearing a mask all day. For the first question regarding the whole lung radiation, I mean, fortunately, um, we don't do this too commonly, um, but we do, we do this for, uh, for kids with Ewing sarcoma and rhabdomyosarcoma. Um, you know, the side effects from radiation for these kids is really quite low, which is uh, different than what we would see in adults. If we put adults, especially older smokers, through this treatment, we would see, you know, a fair amount of toxicity. So, um, you know, I think it's a little unknown what the risk of COVID would be, you know, for a child that's been through this therapy. I don't know that I have the data to give a specific recommendation. Um, you know, while, when their counts are recovered and they're, you know, doing well, I, I think it would be reasonable to consider sending them to school. Um, it's a decision I'm making today, actually, with my youngest, who's a healthy child, and, you know, it's hard to know what to do. So um, I think parents should be supported in, in whichever decision is right from a medical standpoint. I don't have the evidence to say that they should or, or shouldn't, um, but I'd like to hear Tom or Ming's thoughts on this as well. It's a great question. So, so I actually had, that was actually my next question is I'll just show it quickly for, because we're going to transition to that anyway. Um, but I, I did want to know that as well is um, I think it's not only a question that's relevant for, for pediatric patients, but also for adults. So Tom or Ming or, or both, do you have any special considerations for adults who have had lung radiation? For sarcoma, we do this some. Um, and then what about if they haven't had lung radiation, but they've had radiation elsewhere, like to their leg or their arm? Well, I think in terms of their risk for uh, COVID-19, I think we're still learning that. It's a, new, it's a new disease. I would echo what Stephanie said. I think once a patient has recovered from uh, the acute uh, side effects of chemotherapy and radiation, um, then I think that's a 
and that's a, we, a question you can address on a case-by-case -case basis. Do they have other medical problems? Um, and what the, the ongoing frequency of COVID infection is in the, uh, in the community, what, where, where they reside. Uh, I think for the patients we radiate for sarcomas in the lung, we're usually using radiation uh, is what we refer to as stereotactic radiation, highly focused radiation for patients who have a small number uh, of lung nodules uh, that uh, might not be amenable to surgery or a patient may have had prior surgery uh, or radiation is being used as an alternative to surgery or even some other ablative techniques. Uh, and for those patients, the, the volume of lung we radiate is quite small. Um, and so my own sense is that I think once they have recovered from the radiation treatment and they're not having any uh, ongoing dyspnea, uh, on, ongoing uh, shortness of breath, uh, they're non-smokers, uh, I think they can probably try to uh, return to uh, activity like other uh, people in the community. I would say that probably the, the children that I have had that have had some lung toxicity are the um, pretty specific cases, but children who have a, a primary tumor of the rib or the chest, where we end up treating that to a high dose postoperatively with lung radiation, those are children that can develop symptomatic radiation pneumonitis, which is an inflammation of the lungs and requires steroids and shortness of breath. So those children I would probably consider um, higher risk and consider differently. And like Tom said, if they're in an area where COVID is really a high prevalence, um, would discuss with the parents potentially keeping them home. Yeah, I agree with both uh, Stephanie and, and Tom. Um, but um, in adult patients, I would say specifically, um, if you have had radiation to the lung, whether it's SBRT, as Tom mentioned, stereotactic body radiation, or um, chest wall radiation that would actually also involve some radiation dose to the lung, I would try to refrain from smoking. If you are a smoker, try to quit. I think. Um, the risk of having complications is much higher if you continue to smoke. That's the only thing. Um, with COVID risks, uh, it's, it's just data is too new, too small to, to know for sure. Yeah, I think that that's really an important point that should be echoed because I, I, I say this to a lot of my own patients as well, that it's just such a new thing. We just don't have great studies about how COVID interacts with patients with cancer and therapies. And um, I, I think I agree with most, most of you that in general, I've been telling my patients on active therapy or those that are on chemo or active lung radiation probably to be more careful, but patients who have recovered back to their baseline probably can, um, can, can uh, you know, do, do kind of standard recommendations that other people are following as well. One so, thing I um, add to you, Matt, what I have been telling my patients is that uh, going back to patients who are under therapy, if you were to test positive, it can lead to treatment delays during your course of radiation. Um, so I think that's another reason to really try to stay home um, if you're un actively undergoing treatment. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think that um, in general, probably across cancer types, we know that people who have big delays in their treatment, they tend to have um, outcomes that are not as good. So I think that that's a major reason why we should be careful with it, for sure. Um, so we have a little time left. Um, I would like to, so what I'd like to do is, um, Let's do this. There was actually a live question that asked about the different types of radiation. Um, and we had one question that touched on a type we haven't mentioned yet that we do use in sarcoma. So I'd like to jump to that. Um, so we talked already about external radiation, like photon radiation or proton radiation. And that's where a machine kind of makes a beam of radiation that we use to treat cancers from the outside. Um, there is another type of radiation. There was a specific question about it, um, and that's called brachytherapy or internal radiation. So actually, this question I was going to direct at you, uh, Tom, um, so let me show it on the screen here. 
Um, how might brachytherapy catheters be used during surgery for retroperitoneal sarcoma that is touching the spinal bones or large blood vessels? And I will just explicitly say that we can use brachytherapy catheters in the extremity, but this was the question that was asked uh, specifically. That traditionally we have not used brachytherapy often in the abdomen, and the primary reason is that the tumors are often quite large and uh, if the catheters are placed at the time of surgery, they're often up against uh, bowel, which uh, will uh, limit the radiation dose that you can uh, deliver. Uh, that being said, there are now some uh, what are called unidirectional brachytherapy sources, just a, a sources that emit radiation in just one direction. So I think that does give us a, an additional option for uh, some patients, particularly those who have a recurrence after prior uh, surgery and, and radiation where uh, it allows you to deliver some additional radiation uh, at the time of uh, another surgical procedure. Uh, brachytherapy traditionally we more commonly used for extremity uh, sarcomas and it was a convenient uh, treatment in the sense that uh, the, um, the catheters were placed at the time of surgery and the radiation was uh, started about five days after surgery and it was delivered over five days. So it was very convenient for patients. Um, there are, well, we think of that in terms of patient convenience, one of the um, uh, changes coming uh, potentially down the future is shorter radiation schedules, which are being tested for patients with sarcomas. There are two ongoing studies, one looking at preoperative radiation in uh, three weeks and the other uh, uh, down to, uh, to one week. So uh, those are some uh, uh, studies that are uh, currently ongoing that may change our practice. Traditionally, our preoperative courses of radiation were 25 treatments over the course of five weeks. So I think that in many other uh, uh, cancer sites, uh, breast and prostate, uh, lung, uh, for example, uh, shorter radiation uh, schedules have been shown to be uh, effective and safe. And I think we are moving in that direction for uh, extremity sarcomas as well. Yeah, that was actually one of the questions we did get that we probably won't have time to cover in detail today was what's new in radiation. And I think one of the newest things we're going to see over the next year is probably very short courses of radiation, especially in the arms or the legs or the extremities. Um, I know there's been a couple of institutions looking at this, and there's been some positive studies. So I think that um, that's something we're going to start using more and more. I agree with you there. Um, so... We have a couple, we have time for a couple questions left, so I do want to get to um, one specifically that was asked um, before the event, and then we probably have one more to ask that was, um, that was a live one. So for this one, I'd actually like to direct this specifically at you, May, I know you're an expert in this area. So um, the question was, can chemotherapy and radiation be combined for the treatment of sarcomas? And then if you use combined chemo radiation, um, can it be used when a surgery is planned, or is it only used when a surgery is not planned, or can you use it for any situation? Yeah, so this is a really big question, actually. The answer to this will be very different if it's addressed to pediatric tumors. Um, Stephanie will probably have different answers um, when, it, when it's addressed to pediatric uh, soft tissue sarcomas. But for adults, um, um, the you know, one, you know, th there are so many different histologies of soft tissue sarcoma. So often, um, you know, one effective therapy is a high dose aim, and that's not combined with radiation. But um, specific, specifically, certain histologies are shown to be, uh, you know, effective when radiation is combined with a particular uh, chemotherapy like isbosamide, for instance. And, and then there are active studies uh, ongoing to look at uh, targeted agents uh, specifically for different pathways to combine with radiation. Uh, you know, again, to, to reduce both local recurrence and, um, and nodal slash distal, distant recurrence in soft tissue sarcoma, especially the large, very large high-grade tumors where we still have uh, poor outcomes um, for those. So the answer is yes, um, but it's very specific for his certain histologies and certain tumor types. Yeah, that's and that's exactly. So I was hoping to to hear from you. I think that that's exactly right. And um, we might there were several people that had asked like, what's what's new with radiation with sarcoma? And there's actually a lot. 
Um, so I think what, what we'd like to do is try to figure out a way to get to get these answers out to to people. Maybe review some of the some of the new concepts. One of them is 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 actually your study, right? So I think that there's a lot of interesting um, studies that are using different systemic therapy or chemotherapy drugs to combine with radiation to make the radiation work better. I think it's a really exciting area of research. Um, Stephanie, what about for pediatric patients? What about chemotherapy and radiation together? Yeah, so the majority of children with sarcomas will receive uh, chemotherapy, um, some with surgery and radiation or one or the other. Um, there are some low-grade sarcomas that we call kind of the non-rhabdo sarcomas, and that's a catch-all for a lot of sarcomas. There are some low-grade uh, tumors that can be treated with surgery alone, kind of like Tom said, lower grade, small, completely removed with surgery. Um, but by and large, our, our children uh, will be getting some combination of chemotherapy, radiation, and or surgery. Um, the new, you know, the new approach is similar to what Ming said, adding targeted agents to chemotherapy to try and improve outcome. From a radiation standpoint, for tumors that are not being controlled as well as we would like, we're increasing the dose of radiation. For children that are doing really well, who have an excellent response to chemotherapy, sometimes the tumors disappear with chemotherapy, we're reducing the dose of radiation. So, you know, we're kind of taking each child, instead of just saying you have rhabdomyosarcoma, what type do you have, what stage, how's it responding to chemo, how does it look under the microscope, and tailoring uh, the radiation to really give the best outcome with the least amount of radiation possible. So um, a little bit of time left. I have a, we have some live questions coming in. Some of these are, are really important. I think this one, I probably get asked this question like by almost every patient. So what are, uh, so the question that came from the group or from the live chat was, um, is it true that radiated tissue keeps radiating after the treatment is over? Um, maybe another way to ask this question is, is it true that patients become radioactive when they're treated with radiation? Anyone can answer that one. Matt, I can answer that. Uh, for most radiations, patients are not radioactive. Uh, it turns out for proton radiation, they in fact are very slightly radioactive for about uh, about half an hour after their treatment. It's a very, very low, low, low dose. But uh, most, I think what we do know is that the biologic effects of the radiation continue after the treatment. And so patients sometimes will have tumors that are uh, radiated and they don't, they may not change much or um, that they, they don't have um, what we refer to as a response at the end of radiation, but the radiation will often continue to work for, uh, particularly for those tumors that aren't removed uh, for uh, many months after the radiation is completed. So with, with knowing that, um, outside of that small exception for, for the proton radiation, do you, um, so then do you counsel your patients to be careful in any way related to this, or is it something that people don't really have to worry about? Uh, at least, uh, even for the proton patients, they really, the only um, recommendation I, I would make for them is that I, I, I wouldn't hold the child for the first 20 minutes after proton radiation. And, right. that, and that's that's being very very conservative. It's an extremely low dose of uh, radiation that they emit. It, it's 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 technically there. So that's my only suggestion for them. Uh, Stephanie, do, is there any um, is there any caveat to this answer for young patients receiving radiation, or is it the same idea for for patients that are younger or children? Yeah, we, um, I typically don't give any specific recommendations. Uh, typically after the treatment, they're in the stroller and in the car. Um, so I haven't given recommendations about holding them. Um, the dose of radiation is really, uh, it is detectable, but quite small. And then for, um, for x-rays, the radiation is gone, you know, immediately. And we, uh, which is nice. They can be with their brothers and sisters at home and their friends. Um, but I agree with, with Tom, even though the radiation is finished on Tuesday, if that's your last day, the effects of radiation as far as it uh, causing response can continue for many weeks. So that's why we don't typically image patients who have intact sarcomas immediately after radiation, because we're not going to see the full effects of that for, for uh, probably weeks to months.
Yeah, and that's actually a really good point. I might expand on that a little bit because I give this advice very often in my sarcoma clinic is um, it's if, especially if you do get an image kind of close to the end of radiation or right after you finish, it can sometimes be a little bit confusing because um, tumors don't immediately shrink always. The, dam the damage to the cells takes some time to manifest. And then sometimes things can be inflamed, which can make it hard to interpret the scan. So, so I often just counsel patients that um, often if there's a scan that happens right after completion of treatment, it's, it's more like the next scan is the one that we tend to, to look at for the action on the specific tumor that we radiated. There are still other reasons to do those scans. We're looking elsewhere in the body or things like that. But in general, I, I usually give that advice as well. Um, Let's do one thing. I just want to, we have a couple more minutes. I want to squeeze in um, one more question here because it was asked beforehand. We sort of mentioned it in passing a couple of times. Let me just scroll over here to it. Um, we'll have to be a little bit brief with this answer. Um, I'm going to direct this uh, first to Stephanie and then we'll ask about adults um, as well. But um, so for this question, it was, I think this was just generally asking, but how is definitive radiation used in sarcomas in pediatric patients or young adults that are unresectable, such as Ewing sarcoma of the pelvis? And just to clarify, what I think what we mean by this question is when we determined as a group with our other multidisciplinary providers like the surgeons or the medical oncologists that a surgery is not safe to do, such as in the area of like the pelvis in a young patient with Ewing sarcoma, how, how is radiation used as the main treatment for the, for the tumor if surgery is not planned? I mean, the good news with, with children with sarcoma, I, I would say this for rhabdomyosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma, they are very sensitive to radiation and chemotherapy. So if we can determine up front that a child is not resectable, typically they will start with chemotherapy for some period of weeks. Um, and then come to radiation with chemotherapy, um, you know, nine weeks later, 12 weeks later, it depends on the tumor. At that time, the tumor is typically smaller, and then we start this definitive course. So that means the treatment for your tumor will be radiation and chemo with, not, with no plan for surgery. And, you know, the good news is that local control with chemotherapy and radiation for many pediatric sarcomas is very good. And if the surgery uh, would be a massive undertaking, an amputation, uh, function compromising, then we feel it is, you know, most appropriate that those children are treated with, with chemo and radiation. And that's typically around a six week course of radiation. Yeah, and, and I, Tom, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I know you've done some research in this area. We sort of approach this similarly in adults, isn't that correct? There, we do sometimes use what we call definitive radiation or radiation is the only treatment for a sarcoma in an adult if we feel that surgery is not safe to do. Is that correct? Uh, that's, that's correct, uh, Matt. Again, uh, the situations this might pertain to might be a tumor of the upper sacrum. For example, there's an uncommon tumor called a chordoma where the surgery would, in, would, would uh, entail loss of bowel and bladder control. And we've used uh, definitive radiation, uh, high-dose radiation, uh, often using techniques such as protons that will spare the pelvic tissues in front of the sacrum uh, with tumor control on the order of um, 75 to 80 percent in, uh, in patients where uh, surgery would be uh, have a devastating uh, local uh, impact on, uh, on function and, and quality of life. Great. So um, we just have a couple minutes left here, and I think what I'd like to do um, is uh, actually just show um, quickly our rtanswers.org, um, just because we only have we only have about a minute left here, so it's hard to kind of squeeze in one more question. But um, what I'll do is I'll just kind of show this here. We um, Astro and rtanswers.org is a site that's great for um, for patients. Really, um, it has information about all cancer types, but um, so in, in honor of um, Sarcoma Awareness Month, we, we've actually released um, a new section that is specifically focused on sarcoma. Uh, um, and this section includes um, a lot of information just generally about sarcoma. Um, we've, we've, there's some nice figures about the different types of sarcoma and things like that. Uh, we talk extensively about the side effects that um, can be related to treatment, how to best care for yourself, um, 
of what to expect during radiation. And then importantly, we try to point our patients to some important resources. Um, there are many foundations that, that sort of provide support and, and information for patients that have been diagnosed with sarcoma. And those can be great places to turn um, at, at the beginning of things when, when you're seeking information. Um, so this site is up there now. It's at rtanswers.org. And you can um, sort of, uh, you, you can go to the homepage there and select sarcoma as the cancer type, and it should pull up uh, the new information page that, that has all that information there um, for for patients. All right, so um, uh, I just want to um, thank all of you for for joining me here. I just want to repeat one, just kind of one time for for who's who's here. Uh, our participants tonight were were Tom Delaney, who um, is a professor of radiation oncology at Mass Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. So thank you, thank you for coming. Um, yeah. Stephanie Perkins is an associate professor of radiation oncology at Washington University in St. Louis. And then Meg Wallover um, is a associate professor of radiation oncology at the Ohio State University at James Cancer Center. Um, and again, I just want to thank all of you for, for joining uh, us tonight to kind of review this and answer all of our patients' questions. Thank you, Matt. Great job, uh, Matt. I just wanted to also make sure we introduce, uh, thank our moderator as well. So that's uh, Dr. Matthew Spraker again. He's the assistant professor of radiation oncology at Washington University in St. Louis. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks.